Okay, thanks. Um, first of all, I'd like to begin by saying that uh, Jeff's talk was one of the most uh, inspiring uh, and beautiful uh, conference presentations I think I've ever, ever attended. It was really, really great and uh, the proverbial hard act to follow. Uh, but um, I think that uh, his presentation was, um, so often I feel like uh, there's a disconnect uh, at conferences uh, between one event and the next, that there's no interface, but uh, I think that uh, it provides a very nice uh, introduction to the uh, talk that I'd like to do here uh, because it focuses in on uh, my particular sort of history, intellectual history, in uh, the area of environmental ethics and philosophy, which deals with the values domain that Jeff so nicely uh, introduced. Um, as some of you know, uh, many of you do, my work is focused uh, on developing the uh, Aldo Leopold land ethic. And the Leopold land ethic, I think, has uh, not only uh, touched our capacity for values, but also capacity for imagination. Uh, it's what I call uh, the sort of environmentalist's ethic of choice. Uh, it's inspired people in the wilderness movement. Uh, you see references to uh, the Leopold land ethic in conservation biology and uh, in a number of uh, both scientific and and sort of movement um, uh, aspects of uh, the environmental uh, 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 consciousness today. But I think that the land ethic is a 20th century uh, phenomenon, and uh, I've been increasingly aware of the inadequacy of the land ethic, its disconnect, if you will, uh, in terms of our global uh, consciousness today. The land ethic, I think, is, is, is scaled to uh, a more local landscape level rather than a global sort of consciousness. And since the 1950s, when Leopold was very presciently uh, formulating the land ethic on the basis of state-of-the-art ecology, uh, the science which informed the land ethic has sort of now uh, moved on, uh, and it sort of leaves the land ethic thus it, it, a little bit in a, in a circumstance of irrelevancy to our current concerns, and also uh, that its scientific foundations uh, are a little bit problematic. Um, so be because Leopold has been such an inspiring figure, uh, in the contemporary environmental uh, uh, movement and conservation movement, uh, it, 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 it occurred to me that it might be um, worthwhile to explore other alternatives that Leopold actually presents that might be better scaled for our current concerns and uh, uh, established on a scientific tradition that's a little bit more uh, relevant to our problems as well. So anyway, uh, the, well, the title of the talk is Storming the Temporal Boundaries of Nature Toward an Earth Ethic as Opposed to a Land Ethic Scaled for the Challenge of Global Climate Change and Mass uh, Species Extinction. Uh, Leopold has three landmark essays uh, in environmental ethics. The first is Some Fundamentals of Conservation in the Southwest which was originally written in 1923, but remained unpublished. It was published in 1979 in Environmental Ethics. And there, uh, quite amazingly, Leopold sketches an Earth or Gaian ethic based on respect for nature. Uh, the next uh, effort was a decade later, the conservation ethic, which is very interesting because it, it's a sketch of a consumption ethic. It talks about things like Hummers, they didn't exist then, but uh, buying green and paying uh, premiums for uh, clean products and so on with no real theoretical foundations. And then the land ethic in 1949, which we're mostly familiar with, with Darwinian evolutionary 
uh, and Eltonian ecological uh, foundation. So the, the gist of this talk, and it is, I'm describing it as experimental because I'm just now beginning to work my way through this in a, in a book project, uh, as I mentioned before, is that the ecological scale of the 1949 Leopold land ethic, the reigning environmental ethic of ch choice to guide individual action in public environmental policy is, is, un is today a poor fit for global scale, uh, long-term environmental concerns, and that the 1923 uh, Leopold Earth ethic actually represents a better fit. Uh, Aldo Leopold in th uh, early, middle, and late, roughly corresponding to the three essays that I just mentioned. Um, just briefly, the evolutionary or ecological foundations of the Leopold land ethic. All ethics, uh, Leopold writes, uh, so far evolved. There's the evolutionary aspect, rest on a single premise, that the individual is a member of a community of interdependent parts. Ecology simply enlarges the boundary of the community to include soils, waters, plants, animals, or collectively the land. So you can see the focus here is on the community scale in ecology. Uh, and then uh, uh, finally, a land ethic changes the role of Homo sapiens from conqueror of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for his fellow members and also respect for the community as such. Um, to, to sort of, in the interest of time, to sort of uh, run through this very quickly, um, I think that uh, Leopold actually borrowed the, some of the intellectual foundations directly from Charles Darwin uh, in uh, The Descent of Man, in which the, the fourth chapter of which is devoted to a chapter-long discussion of how we might have evolved ethics. It's called the moral sense. Uh, and basically, Doran uh, connects the origins of ethics with the fact that we are a social species and we need to restrain our freedom of action in, 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 in order to enable ourselves to live together. As he puts it so vividly, no tribe could hold together if murder, robbery, treachery, etc. were common, hence crimes within the limits of the same tribe are branded with everlasting infamy. So the sort of uh, result here, uh, the, the fundamental idea is that ethics and society are correlative and therefore as society evolves, there's a sort of social evolution as well as biological evolution, ethics evolve in parallel uh, to that. And so, um, slide is a little off there. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, we, for, uh, Darwin traces the social evolution from the tribe to the nation, the nation state, the global village. And with each expansion of society, there's a corresponding or parallel expansion of uh, ethics. And what I think that Leopold did was simply to uh, take from Charles Elton's uh, very uh, influential book in 1927, Animal Ecology, the community paradigm in ecology, and simply sort of point out that in addition to being members of extended families, uh, 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 ethnic groups, uh, uh, municipal communities, nation states, and so on, we're also members of a biotic community. And so if our ethics evolves in parallel to our consciousness, our perception of community membership, then the land ethic sort of follows as a natural uh, consequence of that progression and that the key then to uh, a kind of dissemination of the land ethic is sort of universal ecological uh, education, which doesn't necessarily take, a, it's not limited to a scientific sort of form, but involves all of the things that Jeff was talking about. In addition to that, imagination and and so on, the sort of things that I think Mitch is also um, uh, getting at. But there are problems with the Leopold land ethic. There was a paradigm shift in ecology that was consolidated in the 1970s, it really undermines it. Uh, uh, there, there was a, a shift to a sort of neo-Gleasonian view of biotic communities. Their spatial boundaries are vague and porous. There's no typology or taxonomy, there's no therefore coherent identity to communities. Uh, temporal boundaries between successional sayers are vague. Successional change is ateleological, it doesn't terminate in any stable self-replicating 
climax there. Natural disturbance, fire, flood, drought, wind are all incorporated, frequent and rhythmic. So there's little integrity or stability associated with biotic communities to be preserved from the perspective of contemporary ecology. Now, I think that the Leopold ethic, land ethic can be dynamized, dynamized, as I put it, and therefore sort of rescued uh, if human communities are ontologically robust enough to generate duties and obligations, so are biotic communities, and they're pretty vague and so on as well. And so uh, we, can, um, we can add in dynamic elements to Leopold's conception of the community, and I've tried to revise it along the the following lines, uh, Leopold's famous uh, summary moral maxim, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. We can now say a thing is right when it tends to disturb the biotic community only at normal temporal and spatial scales. It's wrong when it tends otherwise. Um, so a dynamized land, I think, I think is useful but still limited. It's useful in regard to ethically evaluating community up to landscape scaled and rapid and reversible human disturbances such as point source pollution, uh, our agricultural and forestry uh, practices, uh, uh, recreational activities, local development such as residential, commercial, and so on. But it's limited in regard to larger global scaled long-term, possibly irreversible human disturbances such as climate change, mass extinction, the stratospheric ozone hole, uh, and so on. The first wave of the environmental crisis in the 1960s, those of you who are around remember it, was focused on the former, but I think that in the middle of the 1980s, when we began to realize the scale of extinction, uh, and uh, climate change began to come on the radar, not only among a small group of scientists, but in a somewhat larger <laughs> group of the public, unfortunately not large enough, uh, the land ethic simply doesn't really match up to these uh, kinds of concerns. But the 1923, if we go back to Leopold's very first paper, uh, and, and again, why Aldo Leopold? Because he has this cachet, this power not only to express ideas in a, in a scientifically informed way, but also to involve poetry and, and imagination as well. Uh, he writes, it is at least not impossible to regard the Earth's parts, soil, mountains, rivers, atmosphere, etc., as organs or parts of organs of a coordinated whole, each part with a definite function. And if we could see this whole as a whole through a great period of time, we might perceive not only organs with coordinated functions, but possibly also that process of consumption and replacement, which in biology we call metabolism or growth. In such a case, we would have all the visible attributes of a living thing which we do not now recognize to be such because it is too big and its process is too slow. And there would also follow that invisible attribute, a soul or consciousness, which not only Uspensky but many philosophers of all ages ascribe to all living things and aggregations thereof, including the dead earth. There's not much discrepancy, he goes on, except in language between this conception of a living earth and the conception of a dead earth with enormously slow, intricate, and interrelation functions among its parts as given us by physics, chemistry, and geology. Notice there's a different sort of scientific base, not so much ecology, but what today we call biogeochemistry. The essential thing for present purposes is that both admit the interdependent functions of the elements. Possibly in our, in our intuitive perceptions, which may be truer than our science and less impeded by words than our philosophies, we realize the indivisibility of the earth, its soil, mountains, rivers, forests, climate, plants, animals, and respect it collectively, not only as a useful servant, but a living being, vastly less alive than ourselves in degree, but vastly greater than ourselves in time and space, a being that was old when the morning stars sang together and when the last of us has been gathered unto his fathers will still be young. Pretty powerful poetry, isn't it? Uh, 
what are the foundations of Leopold Earth ethic? Well, where, where, where was that from uh, specifically? Yes. Some fundamentals of, it's innocuously entitled, or titled, Some Fundamentals of Conservation in the Southwest. Three, Conservation as a Moral Issue, the third part. It was published in volume one, number two of Environmental Ethics, the journal. And it's also reprinted in The River of the Mother of God and other essays by Older Leopold, which Susan Flatter and I edited. Uh, three foundations of the Leopold Earth ethic, um, a kind of individual and collective virtue ethics. Uh, he, Leopold, uses the technique of synecdoche. Ezekiel sort of represents our classic uh, Judeo-Christian heritage. Ezekiel seems to scorn waste, pollution, and unnecessary damages, something unworthy, something damaging, not only to the reputation of the waster, but to the self-respect of the craft and the society of which he is a member. And that's just mentioned in passing. And then there's what, from Brian Norton, we might think of as a long anthropocentrism responsibility to future generations. So the privilege of possessing the earth entails the responsibility of passing it on, the better for our use, not only to immediate posterity, but to the unknown future. And that's also mentioned in passing. And then I think, and this is a little bit technical from a philosophical point of view, there's a Kantian non-anthropocentrism, if that's not a um, oxymoron, uh, uh, namely, respect for Earth's intrinsic value. It is possible that Ezekiel respected the soil, not only as a craftsman respects his material, but as a moral being respects a living thing. And that's developed over the next six paragraphs, so it's not mentioned in passing. Uh, two of those paragraphs have just been quoted uh, previously. So, back in 1923, where did Leopold get these ideas? Uh, biogeochemistry was first articulated by Vladimir Vernadsky in the 1920s and developed by G.E. Hutchinson in the 1950s, way after Leopold was writing this particular piece, indeed after he was dead, and James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis in the last quarter of the 20th century as essentially the Gaia hypothesis. Um, and of course, it's not small scale, community, ecosystem level, ecology, and evolutionary uh, biology. It's biogeochemistry. Now, where did Leo, how did Leopold get acquainted with anything that Vernadsky might have written? Uh, because Vernadsky's writing was all in Russian and was not translated into, into English until the 1940s. And it may have been via P.D. Uspensky, whom Leopold was reading, uh, but it was Vernadsky who coined the term biosphere and speculated about the existence of a noosphere. Uh, the Le Leopold Earth ethic, I think, avoids the temporal and spatial scale problems bedeviling the land ethic. Uh, biotic communities and ecosystems are difficult to isolate as robust entities. Uh, some suspect that they're mere theoretical artifacts. But the Earth, by contrast, is ontologically robust. It has clear boundaries requir requiring no mentation uh, to isolate. And there it is. Is that the same photograph? Uh, so, same other systems. Yeah, I'm not sure from whom I stole it, but <laughs> anyway, this is just between us. It's not published. So uh, there's no doubt that the Earth is an entity, whereas we might wonder about ecosystems and biotic communities. This is a fairly clear example of a real thing uh, with an essence and so on. Uh, the old balance of nature paradigm in ecology, which Leopold was appealing to, uh, considered uh, ecosystems to be closed, self-regulating. Uh, they tend toward a stable point of equilibrium. Uh, they have determinate and invariant successional pathways uh, and so forth, according to these contemporary ecologists. And the new flux of nature paradigm in ecology uh, looks at ecosystems as open uh, to various influences. Uh, they have external as well as internal regulatory factors, multiple domains of ecological attractions. Uh, uh, they're ontologically fuzzy, and indeed their ontology is driven by epistemology. Uh, Tim Allen, for example, at the University of Wisconsin uh, is very, um, 
uh, insistent on this. The question you ask, basically, as an ecologist, defines the ecosystem. So, so what it is depends on your, the, the, the way you interrogate it, which makes it a bit of a ghostly thing. So, um, now, the biosphere, I think, has many characteristics of the old ecosystem paradigm. It's relatively closed. It's open only to sunlight, other radiation, incidental cosmic material, some influence from galactic and other solar system sources via gravity and so on, but it's relatively closed. Self-regulating, which is the core concept of the Gaia hypothesis, and single points of equilibria for many uh, biogeochemical cycles. Uh, I don't know if this is all right or not, but uh, <laughs> you, you know, tell me if it's if, if I'm in serious error here. But uh, uh, anyway, um, thus the Earth is a well as a well-defined. This is, I'm sort of bold-facing this self-regulating entity is a robust object that we can respect as such, and at stable points of equilibria can serve as norms in relation to which we can morally evaluate those of our actions affecting these equilibria. But notice the biosphere, and this is something that comes out here in, in Jeff's talk, too is subject to equilibria fluctuations and catastrophic disturbances. And so I'm going to run through this very quickly uh, because uh, we're all fairly familiar uh, with this from the previous talk. Here we have um, temperature fluctuations over, over time, uh, and uh, it's subject to catastrophic disturbance. For example, the meteor in impact that may have done in the dinosaurs 65 uh, million years ago, uh, and so on. So I think that for an Earth ethic to be meaningful, we have to consider the the spotlight, as I like to think of it, in terms of its the way it focuses on a certain scale, temporally speaking, especially, because otherwise, uh, you know, uh, how long ago was it that the Earth was a uh, hundred million years ago was uh, had temperatures that are much higher than today. Uh, uh, and there's been fluctuations since. I mean, why is the Earth more stable, for example, than ecosystems are, reg uh, are regarded as stable? I think that that can, that can be dealt with in terms of defining, carefully defining temporal scales and asking how these scales interface with one another, that there are temporal boundaries as well as spatial boundaries uh, and that will enable us, I think, to think coherently about an Earth ethic. So, uh, the ecologist C.S. Holling has identified uh, several um, uh, temporal scales. The, what he calls the vegetative scale, I think better would be an organismic temporal scale, which is defined by certain processes, photosynthesis and metabolism. The ecological temporal scale which might be defined in terms of the processes of succession and disturbance. The climatic temporal scale, uh, and that's sort of difficult to uh, identify, but nevertheless, and over on the right-hand side are the actual uh, dimensions of those scales. The evolutionary temporal scale, uh, the processes are adaptation, speciation, extinction, and finally, the geomorphological temporal scale uh, which is at millions to billions of years, defined by processes such as plate tectonics, upthrust, erosion, the rock cycle, uh, and so on. Now, I think that there are boundary conditions at the interface of temporal scales, and the first one here, I think, is the most important one. And that is, albeit themselves dynamic, upscale processes may be regarded as stable vis-a-vis -vis downscale processes. And thank you, Jeff, for mentioning one, uh, which is the second example. Canada is increasing in elevation, as you just mentioned, rebounding from the weight of Pleistocene ice and moving northwest with the North American plate. But an ecologist studying the population dynamics of snowshoe hare and Arctic fox 
at the ecological temporal scale may regard the elevation in latitude and longitude at the geomorphological scale of our study site is unchanging, right? So, so we, even though we have dynamic processes going on over large scales in the Earth from the point of view of scales that may matter to us, the organismic and the ecological, they can be treated as stable in respect to downscale processes. Uh, the boundary conditions at the interface of temporal scales, further upscale processes constrain downscale processes. Climate constrains what happens at the or, or organismic level. Uh, disturbance regimes constr constrain those as well. Uh, downscale processes are constitutive of upscale processes. Weather constitutes climate, for example, though weather takes place on a scale that's that's basically annual, whereas climate is on a much larger scale. Um, and downscale processes are damped down and averaged out as they cross the border uh, to constitute upscale processes. In other words, weather occurs on kind of unpredictable patterns, uh, but yet over an annual period of time, we average rainfall and so on, and thus we can talk about the climate of, of uh, Tucson as opposed to uh, Portland. Um, and finally, changed rates, and this is the important thing, of constitutive downscale processes can storm across the border and alter upscale processes, and that's one way of talking about what's happening right now, where global climate change is concerned. We are doing things that are storming across the border and changing upscale processes at a more rapid rate than they would normally uh, do so. So here is the summary and conclusion. The Leopold Earth Ethic provides, first of all, an ontological robust, ontologically robust object of respect, the Earth. The Leopold Earth Ethic provides clear norms against which to measure and ethically assess human changes, upscale conditions which also fluctuate naturally, but at rates so slow in comparison with humanly relevant temporal scales that they may be regarded as stable. Examples are composition of the atmosphere and oceans, global climate, and global biodiversity. The Leopold Earth Ethic, therefore, is better scaled spatially and temporally for morally engaging post-1980s environmental concerns that are spatially global and temporally centennial and millennial in scale. So here's the proposed golden rule for the Leopold Earth Ethic. A thing is wrong when it storms across the temporal boundary and rapidly speeds the rate of otherwise slowly fluctuating equilibria at higher temporal scales, and whether it's right or not depends on other considerations. So this is sort of a, a via negativa where <laughs> ethics is concerned. Oh, okay, what are some examples? Anthropogenic doubling of atmospheric carbon causing global temperatures to rise at an enormous, an abnormal rate and doing so in a matter of decades as opposed to millennia. Uh, anthropogenic species extinction at rates exceeding the rate of speciation. Uh, if you've ever thought about biodiversity just in an a priori way, that is to say, if we've got a huge number of species, nobody knows how many, 30 million or so, speciation must have a priori exceeded the rate of ex natural rate of extinction. So there we have a, a sort of uh, norm against which we can measure our, our uh, rates of extinction, anthropogenic rates of extinction, and then the flattening of the trophic structure of the biota of the global ocean by over-harvesting big fish. Okay, so that's my talk, thanks.